what inspires me in general, photographically. I was five years old. I, I was living in Syracuse, New York. My mother took me and my siblings on a three-month trip around the American West. She was from California. And I think it made a lasting impression on me. It fixed the idea of this arid, wonderfully dramatic Western landscape in my mind. There's something about the drama of the Western landscape that is very appealing to me. And it's reminiscent, I think you could say, repeats the trip that so many immigrants came. When they came to the Eastern United States, so many of them eventually ended up in the West. It has appeal that I think around the world people recognize. When I started photographing quite a few decades ago, it was a, a sort of a no-no to ever change anything in front of the camera. Nevertheless, I don't change anything. Um, not necessarily by a principle, because of a principle, but because I'm so interested in what I find there. In one case, I'm photographing trees or landscape that show no evidence of humankind, and in the others, uh, I do. And the thing I like about it, including a human element is that it, it, um, it fixes the photograph in time as well as in place. It says, this is what it was like at that moment. And I was there and I saw that and I thought it was worth paying attention to. So that, in that sense, it's documentary. It's documenting a specific time as well as place. And it's, as a result, showing what it's like to be on this, in this landscape at this time in history. Pictures were selected from two different bodies of work. One is this that we're surrounded by now, the California trees. And the other, I really wouldn't call a body of work, but it's a different format. That's what characterizes the other. They're panoramic images, all made in California. Even though they're different subjects and formats, they're unified, I think, by the fact that I tend to look at the natural world in its own right, but also with a human imprint on the land, how we live on the land. So you see things like a piece of red uh, mesh around a tree. You see things like power lines and the pictures of the palm trees, um, the Saline Valley picture. You see two folding chairs in the foreground. They're all things that I find that I think uh, indicate how we live in the natural landscape. We really need to be uh, responsible to the planet we live on. On the other hand, you know, we're all trying to do our part. So we don't know what the future is. I think we are part of nature. We live in nature. And sometimes we do things, as we all know, especially in this time when we see all the evidence of climate change, we know that, of course, we affect the landscape and the planet adversely. But these pictures are not about that. They're about... Uh, in some cases, perfectly innocent ways in which we make our presence felt in the, in the climate. They're also about the things that people have introduced into the landscape that make for a kind of a puzzling narrative or ambiguity. This is the paradox that we live with, that we sometimes alter things drastically in order for us to survive in this Western environment, this dry environment. Information is actually very important to me. I read about the things that I'm photographing because well, because I'm interested and because it informs me about how to proceed. The American West is a series of north-south running mountain ranges and in between them a basin or a depressed area. I think in geological terms it's a sink. It's called a tectonic sink. It's called Saline Valley because the whole huge part of the American West was once a very large inland sea with salt water. And when those bodies of water dry up, the salt remains. I chose it because I'm, I'm really interested in topography itself and what, what the natural landscape looks like. And that's a good example of an extremely arid environment that uh, shows uh, the configuration called Basin of Range that characterizes the American West. It shows the sort of naked landscape of this Basin of Range area. It has such eccentric pieces of human expression in it. There's a mound about a third of the way into the space toward the center that looks as though it's made of uh, rust. I think it's maybe left over from a volcano. And then there are the details. First of all, on that rust-colored mound, you can see there's a little trail going right up to the top of it. And there's a peace symbol that somebody put into uh, the hillside. In the foreground, you see two folding chairs right there, pink and blue. 
radiating from those chairs are what look like little pathways lined with stones. Somebody who knows who put all those stones along those pathways. Uh, and then leaning against or hanging from one of the arms of the folding chair is a hot pink fly swatter. Who knows? I think that picture was taken from the west looking east and that, that the chairs are probably there to come see the sunset against the mountains that we see. And maybe there are a lot of flies there in the evening and they leave the fly swatter. Uh, it's an example of narrative ambiguity, something that I like in still photographs. In a movie, the mystery of what that is would be revealed, you know, sometime either in the next shot or later in the film. In a still picture, it just remains a, a mystery and it's whimsical. It's so unexpected that you would find that sort of formal arrangement of stones and chairs out there in the middle of uh, such a desolate area. That picture, everything in that picture feels so clean and so like a stage set. For what and by whom? We don't know. So I think there's a humor in that picture. And this question of why people do that, who they were, that they left the fly swatter suggests they forgot it, but the chairs are there that they come back. It's a mystery.